Hi, welcome back to the show. I'm really excited about today's topic because it's something that impacts so many of us. So let's kick it off with a few questions about perimenopause. Now, what do you know about perimenopause? Is it a term that's familiar to you? When you hear perimenopause, what kinds of feelings or thoughts come to mind? Have you ever had a chat about it with your wife, your mum, grandmother, sister, or even a friend? Maybe you or someone close to you has experienced perimenopausal symptoms, or perhaps you're still in the earlier years and haven't really thought about it yet. Either way, I encourage you to stick around as we get into this topic, because at some point, the symptoms and side effects are very likely to touch you or someone else that you care about. So what exactly is perimenopause? It's the transitional phase leading up to menopause, and it plays a significant role in a woman's life journey. During this time, our ovaries gradually produce less oestrogen, and it typically starts in our 40s, although some people experience it as early as their mid-30s. Now, this phase can last anywhere from a few months to a full decade before menstruation stops altogether. On average, it begins at the age of 45, with menopause usually happening between 45 and 55. So let's unpack this together. Perimenopause isn't just about timing. It can bring a range of symptoms that vary in intensity, such as irregular periods, hot flushes, night sweats, mood swings, sleep disturbances, fatigue, vaginal dryness and decreased libido. Historically, many women face significant challenges due to a lack of understanding, medical options and societal support, leaving them to suffer in silence. However, that's changing. Public figures like Gwyneth Paltrow and Oprah Winfrey have openly shared their experiences with perimenopause, highlighting the emotional and physical symptoms they faced, such as mood swings and anxiety. Many people endured severe menopausal symptoms without adequate support or treatment options. They were often misdiagnosed or dismissed with hysteria, which led to stigma and isolation. Without modern treatments like hormone replacement, many relied on ineffective home remedies, while societal expectations pressured them to silently endure their struggles. The taboo that's surrounding women's reproductive health has made it difficult for many to seek the help they need. Now today we have a much better understanding of this natural biological transition, but still, there is so much to talk about. Perimenopause can be an issue due to the physical and emotional changes that many women experience during this transition. No matter whether you're a male or a female, it's really important to understand and acknowledge these changes because they can impact the relationships of everyone concerned. So stick around as we explore this important topic together. I'm Kate Mason, and welcome to Parenting and Personalities. This is the podcast that connects you with the ones you care about the most. My guest today is Anna Goldsworthy. Anna joined me recently to talk about burnout, so please take a moment to go back and check it out after this podcast if you missed it. With an undergraduate degree in exercise science and a master's in rehabilitation, Anna's journey spans over 20 years, including clinical practice research and founding a successful rehabilitation and Pilates practice, Anna Movement. Anna's philosophy centers around the idea that true health success isn't just about physical exercise, but it's about connecting the body and the mind to optimize performance, true health and well-being, even when things aren't perfect. Anna now focuses on empowering individuals through a holistic approach of health and self-awareness. She helps people answer important questions like, how am I getting in my own way? And what is my body telling me? Through a top-down, bottom-up approach, Anna fosters a sustainable relationship with health, empowering clients to thrive in both personal and professional growth. Hi, Anna. Welcome back to Parenting and Personalities. I'm thrilled to have you here with us today. Hi, Kate. Thanks for having me back. Now, we're going to be talking about perimenopause today. And I know that um, people often don't discuss this. It's still not a really big discussion in, in the world, or but it's finally coming through. So we know the effects ourselves, well, I do, of perimenopause and menopause, and we know that they can really affect people, women's physical and mental health. So can you tell us what is perimenopause? Perimenopause is, I think the easiest way to explain it in 
in people's bodies is it's puberty too. It's the mm-hmm. second puberty. And we could all, yeah, we can all <laughs> relate to puberty one where we're just going about life and there's no, <laughs> no one's flicked an outside switch. We didn't ask for it, anything like yep. that. But internally there's been a flick switched within the brain but then changes the communication between the brain and the reproductive organs. And in a way you could think of puberty too is it's the flip of that, the resources in our neurological system, so brain to body um, messages, it's, it's run out of what's required and now this is the time to turn the switch off. I think the most lovely version of that story uh, in theory-wise is the the grandmother theory, and that's the idea. Like A lot of people would be used to hearing about the Darwinism theory and, you know, the, the strong evolve and survive. It doesn't – it's a very male-oriented theory and it doesn't really capture perimenopause. So the grandmother theory is a little bit more celebratory because I think we need that in culture. It's the idea that neither male nor um, female physiology reproduces strong out offspring as we get older. So it sees this uh, biological shift, this recalibration, it's we call it a critical window, same mm-hmm. as puberty. It's critical window of change. It's the turning off of the ability to reproduce so that we don't make um, children that yeah. uh, have yeah. strong um, genetic issues. And that then we come into, which is now starting to be confirmed with science, that we go into this brain space in postmenopause which aligns with less anxiety, more composure. So we slip into this part role in society and within family structures. It's the wise grandmother theory. And I do want to honour that not everyone has children, but that we have these roles of matriarchy within our culture that doesn't relate to having to have children it can just be strong leaders and, you know, people within our community that uh, have these strong roles for us. They don't. It doesn't have to be associated with offspring in particular, but that ultimately every female body will go through this process yeah. inevitably and predictably. Right, right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so with this, with perimenopause, we have menopause after perimenopause and how long does perimenopause last? I mean, is true menopause the 12 months with no period at all? Is that when we've reached it or passed menopause? I've been kind of reading up about it thinking, oh, now which one is it? Because when I went into perimenopause at 45 and I'm still <laughs> at 62, still have symptoms of everything. Um, so where is it supposed to end? Uh, so there, there is a little window of when it's meant to end, but symptoms are interesting because we still have hormones in our body and hormones interact with our organs. So, and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of the symptoms are actually neurologically driven. So that's not these symptoms are coming from my body. It's coming from the brain and our brain is still influenced by uh, stresses and the remaining hormones that are because we have uh, multiple types of estrogen, so we move from the really potent estradiol in our reproductive years to estrone that isn't as potent, but it still has an impact on our body, and we still produce hormones in our body. They're just uh, not as high in volume and impacting our body in that way. And so, for example, uh, hormones interact with uh, fat cells and then fat cells speak to the brain. And this can be this really interesting uh, loop where we end up with symptoms that are associated with perimenopause, but it's then it becomes an actual lifestyle conversation. So Mm -hmm. what does that we just shift the lens about how how we're going about fixing, you know, again, air quotes, do they need to be fixed 
uh, I heard an interesting idea which it doesn't align with everyone, but that this is a rite of passage. So they were having objection to HRT as getting rid of sensations, whereas, you know, life is ultimately a game of suffering. And if we take away the suffering, uh, are we taking away our ability to be resilient and adapt our life in the way that our body is asking us to adapt? So, you know, that that's not for everyone. Mm-hmm. Some people have, mm-hmm. you know, choices are choices. And HRT we now know is a really safe uh, choice uh, path. So we don't want to burden people with, with the judgment of that. But just an interesting mm-hmm. transition of, what it comes down for me is, hey, my body's telling me something. Am I listening? Yeah, yeah. What do I so, need to respond yeah. to? And sorry to answer your question, peri- perimenopause can last upwards of ten years, and right. it's not again like it's it's not particularly associated with the the, the grand symptoms that we talk mm. about. Mm. It's this slow transition that really starts mm. for most people around their forties. Yeah. The window of perimenopause is sort of 45 to 55, uh, but it, it, it goes through lots of changes. Mm. So I started my transition where my skin was a little bit different and my mood around my menstrual cycle was a little bit different. And that started for me probably about 41 mm-hmm. and I'm now 43 and I'm very much in stage two of perimenopause. Mm. But mm. menopause is one day. So... Like you said, the the late stages of perimenopause, which Professor Pryor would refer to as stage four, uh, right. and the lovely author Lara Bryden, who has two really fantastic books if people want to look into them, uh, we go through that late stage where it's been a year since the last uh, menstrual bleed, and it's that day in the calendar where that one day is men- that's menopause. And then right. every day after that is post-menopause, and that's where lifestyle choices, you know, they're always important and important in perimenopause to manage symptoms and make choices mm. and take advantage of these amazing hormones that we still have in our body, protecting our brain, heart, and bones. But post-menopause, the biggest lever we get to pull is our commitment to our lifestyle choices. Yeah. It's a it's a really hard one because um, – I I'm, I've been on HRT for years. Yeah, I'm quite happy to admit it. And I remember think sitting there. My husband said to me at one time, oh, he'd read something about the study that was done in 2002 or whatever. And you know, he said to me, I think you should come off HRT. And I I said to him, I had my he was sitting reading the paper behind me, and I'm sitting there rolling my eyes. And um, I said to him, but if I did, you would be dead. So I can't yeah. because I said. <laughs> I would have killed you by now, um, you know, because for me, I went to a gynecologist and she said to me, I'll put you on antidepressants because I said to her, I just feel annoyed. I'm stressed. I'm not a stressed person. My husband always said to me, 99% of the time you are just easygoing, you know, like nothing. And I think it's down to 75 now. But it was it was um, so so unnatural for me to be that way uh, that, you know, so I – she offered me antidepressants. I said, I'm not depressed. I'm annoyed. <laughs> you know, like, you know, those hormones, those, it's felt like PMT the whole time. You know, it's just that angry feeling the whole time. And HRT has really worked for me. So, you know, for those people that choose to use it, it's been a really wonderful tool for me to have. And it makes my life great. Now, during COVID, they ran out of HRT all over the world, the patches I was using. So I went off it for eight weeks um, because I couldn't get it. And at the end of that time, my son, who I get along with really well, who's in his late 20s, said to me, oh, my God, what is wrong with you? He said, I cannot say anything right. And I thought I'd been really good. I thought I'd been really nice. I was trying really hard to be really nice because I knew that I was feeling really annoyed. And it was a really interesting thing that actually I wasn't. I wasn't actually in control of those feelings. I was obviously feeling pretty upset about it. So back on it again and all my life is good. I know there are people out there that might go, we should suffer because that's what life's set us. I'm a different of the different thought. I'm a, you know what, if if that is there and that is going to save me suffering, once again, you often put on weight during menopause and I had half a stone that I couldn't move. I've always exercised, always eaten well, 
couldn't move it and HRT moved it for me just that so I don't know it yeah I think it's um a very personal decision Mm -hmm. and I encourage people when I'm working with them particularly Mm -hmm. in the courses this is the biggest thing very very early is work on your body literacy so listening to what's happening you know coming out of your mouth that tells you about your mental health or what's not coming out of your mouth and just staying in your mind and what is your body telling you because 70 percent of women with um perimenopause and i think we're 1.8 billion million billion that's that's a big difference but (laughs) we have (laughs) we're a lot lot of women (laughs) 70% 70% of women worldwide are dealing with symptoms wow. that are neurological and mm. psychiatrically oriented. So the most important thing is, is A, start the conversation with your yep. GP who is versed in perimenopause. And in Australia, the best way to find that person is via the Australasian Menopause Society website. Oh, that's uh, good to you know. Jump on and, yeah. yeah, the drop-down bar says uh, find a... Uh, uh, Australasian Menopause Society member, which means they're mm-hmm. someone that's educated in that space. And you also then have a relationship with if I've got an aversion to the support, you know, like you said, you know, I'm very clear on what's right for me and what's wrong for me mm-hmm. so I can identify that I'm frustrated, I'm not depressed, uh, and, and what that means to me. So self-advocation when you actually mm-hmm. come into the session, which can be hard for some people uh, in uh, clinical scenarios. And then, you know, making that decision, uh, functional medicine uh, practitioners are also someone that can complement uh, medical conversations yeah. really, really nicely. And Chinese med, nutrition, mm-hmm. all of the lifestyle, kind of leading into the lifestyle ideas there. And within that own philosophy, my personal approach is, if I'm not going on HRT or there's many women that can't go on HRT mm, because are. of, yeah, they've mm. had changes in their medical mm. history that mean that it's a, not a safe decision to make. Uh, there's some women that have been catapulted into menopause because of surgeries around uh, reproductive organs yeah. and things like that. So if I'm choosing one or the other, still for me the question is with how my body and mind is operating, what matters to me and how am I going about that? So how does my decision fit into my life and how I want to relate to people? And then what do I need to do to give myself the space and tools to be able to do that? I have a a wonderful story of, I'm going to try and keep them short and give you two, two stories. No, no, no. Love a story. One, yeah. One of the women uh, from, from the courses is that she thought she was in a particular stage based on what her menstrual cycle was doing. And then we pulled a strip right back and looked at her stress levels and she was very open to making um, some strong adjustments. Mm. And she went about that and did these strong adjustments. And within uh, a couple of months, she actually returned a regular menstrual cycle. And wow. that's not particularly our aim or, you know, appropriate or, mm. you know, that's not what we're trying to do. But it really told a story about her stress levels and the impact that stress has on her hormones. And then this other one, which was, I loved it because it was a little solution that a client came up with herself is, and this relates to my own story as well. I'm stage two now. I noticed that uh, for women that have ADHD from a research point of view, they're much more likely to have symptoms that are like PMDD. So PMDD represents itself by having very dark and overwhelming thoughts Mm -hmm. uh, and body dysmorphia and uh, disconnection from our body. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's usually associated with the transition into the next menstrual cycle, so in the second half of our menstrual cycle. So I'd had a bit of PMS myself and I had you know, worked with my Chinese medicine practitioner, one, my one gold star that I committed to after my second um, little one for a good two years and, yeah, love that support. Yeah. And I didn't, I really didn't have many PMS issues. 
And then all of a sudden I was having very loud, more like uh, PMDD symptoms, so very disruptive thoughts mm-hmm. that didn't align with how I feel about myself and think about myself, very distracting in terms of trying to sit and concentrate, lots of self-doubt that was just, like, no, I thought we dealt with this, I'm still doing my thing. And I had a client who, this was a couple of years ago compared to my experience, who were screening these ideas in her and she noticed that she was at great capacity to absolutely destroy her marriage (laughs) at that time in her menstrual cycle. So while she was doing all the things and slowly letting them manifest in her body and her mental health, she we would map her ovulation and once she knew she was ovulating because she had a she's gotten to the point of irregular cycles Mm -hmm. as soon as she knew she was ovulating okay we're two weeks from a cycle she would book an airbnb and she would live for 10 days away from her partner yeah yeah and that was her strategy to and Mm -hmm. how how intelligent how good is that absolutely emotionally intelligent is that as a strategy yes and direct outcomes and the partner you know like to explain that to a partner too um because i don't want to be awful but males have no idea like they're not in the body that it's happening to they've got no idea what they've suddenly done wrong which is really sad all of a sudden it you know so i think that's a brilliant idea that's really clever to spot it and say what can i do about it um in that sense that's great and one of the important things is educating uh, males. It's mm. so exciting mm. that uh, Deloitte, the company Deloitte, is leading right. the charge with supporting uh, perimenopause within workplace policies. And Fantastic. we've just had a uh, a hearing to the Senate. I can't remember my technical words with uh, with this, but a report has just been released in right. Australia only two weeks ago. Uh, today on the 4th of October 2024 that uh, advises how we should be now looking at uh, the needs of women in uh, perimenopause and menopause in the workplace, you know, where we spend a significant amount of our time and contribute to that one big lever of stress and how we experience perimenopausal symptoms, um, that that's now being, you know, how do we keep women that want to continue their careers safe in their careers and achieving the things to their fullest capacity like that's exciting to me and that gives relief in the home as well as in the workplace Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. manifests in so many other windows of life oh it does yeah look we haven't talked about all the symptoms let's just list can you list the symptoms that perimenopause brings so <laughs> yeah, I actually should have opened up because I don't. There's actually a, a list. Oh, there are more than I'm thinking. Screen. Oh, okay. Oh, there's right. there's oh. many. I think right. one of the well, most let's go for the major ones. The major ones. One of the most important ones that pops up that people might not uh, associate with perimenopause, and it actually crosses over with burnout, which we chatted about together okay, recently. Yes. Because uh, burnout and perimenopause, burnout makes perimenopause symptoms worse, worse. and yeah. they symptoms mimic each other. Okay. So the 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 one that's amazing and really interesting on the the GP screen to screen if you're eligible for HRT is uh, a feeling of isolation. Yeah, that's a big one and one that mm. people might not uh, mm-hmm. think of. The fact the ones that kind of pop up. Bigger and louder, uh, usually at about stage three of perimenopause, and that's when we're we're having uh, gaps between our menstrual cycle that are longer and more unpredictable. They uh, can be uh, hot flushes and mood regulation and those kinds of things. I think the ones that are important to me at a very early stage is the ones that are, hey, you're in the transition and this is where it's would be really fancy, mm-hmm. fantastic to make some changes in lifestyle here. We need to go about your exercise and your mindset differently is the things that we talked about before, mm-hmm. like yep. more amplified mood changes in certain times of our menstrual cycle. 
feeling disconnected from our sense of agency and how we hold ourselves in high regard. And I would hope people feel that way about themselves. But often in perimenopause, it's where we break down in tears because we've gotten this far without holding ourselves in high regard and understanding Mm. and loving our bodies. Uh, And that's often a thing is the body starts changing its shape and then we go back to our strategies that we did in our 20s that actually make everything worse. Right, right. So uh, we start laying body fat around our um, mm. around our tummies where we're not used to. Yeah. And then uh, away from our hips and our arms where we usually lay body fat. So that's one signal that things are changing. Uh, I think and the mood and the mental health and anxiety, I think, is the most important thing. So uh, there's a varying in stats, 45 to 55% of women will experience mental health uh, changes as part of the neurological brain shifts that are very much what perimenopause mm-hmm. is about, and that is anxiety and depression. Important to talk to your GP about those because it can also be the a crossover of, uh, you know, thyroid issues mm. that might be unchecked mm. or the, the body fat might be an insulin thing that's unchecked uh, around diabetes and that can give yeah. you hot flushes and it might yeah. not be a perimenopause thing. It might be an insulin issue thing, which all mm. gets tied into perimenopause mm. as well. Uh, so they're some of the big ones, but mm. I think the most important thing for your listeners to allow themselves is that a lot of women will go through perimenopause going to their doctor and saying, I feel anxious and depressed, Mm. but they don't have hot flushes or they don't have some of the classic signs and sadly they will be dismissed. Mm. So for some women that... There's, it's it's not a given with HRT around mental health, but for some women they will go on HRT and with in about a month they will feel, air quotes, themselves like your experience, Kate. Yeah. Not everyone yeah. gets, gets no, that and it might be tweaking and other things going on as well, but I think that's really important and sadly it can be upwards of 10 visits to a GP before the conversation wow. gets taken seriously. So that's right. where that self advocacy mm. comes to play. Mm. If this person's not listening to me, what's I need to start dating another GP? Yep. Till I find yep. someone who's interested and eloquent in the in the mm. the details of the conversation. Uh, but little things that pop up in my world are again the shift in mindset can be a burnout conversation and making sure that the burnout and uh, penny perimenopause yep. are being looked at in their windows appropriately, mm-hmm. we e- we end up with old injuries popping up and not going away. So people are trying to fix their uh, the old injury in the same mm-hmm. way and it's not responding, it's taking longer. And is that because I've got anxiety that's driving the pain messages stronger? And do we need to look at the anxiety part? Or is that because there's muscle, uh, there's tissue changes and this has been exciting on the research front because we now have slightly excitingly, slightly frustratingly labelled, uh, some wonderful scientists have labelled the condition perimenopause musculoskeletal syndrome. Oh, great. So what we know about the word syndrome is <laughs> yeah. that we really don't know what it is. Mm. But the good thing is, is that now the more we know about it, it is this idea that the reason I can't get an answer or relief for the sudden frozen shoulder or the sudden mm-hmm. plantar fasciitis that won't go away is because of the hormone shifts. Uh, for me, that looks like prescribing exercise in a very different way than we're used to. And does that help? Or it could be more from the GP and the um, functional practitioner going, let's support your hormones in a particular way, and then all of a sudden they're not waking up with achy legs and stiff Mm. to move. And, you know, there's nothing more detracting than waking up in the morning going, I'm going to seize the day, but I feel unrested and my body's aching. Why would Mm -hmm. I want to get out of bed? (laughs) Why would I want to do exercise? Mm. Mm. So those are some of the big ones. Mm. Yeah. And when you've had a night of hot 
hot fl- flushes, flushes and yeah. <laughs> and you haven't slept well and you wake up and you're crabby and yeah the the day doesn't look very good to start with nor does the poor husband sitting at the breakfast bar but it, yeah and then going so to work tiring. on top of it yeah it's yeah. exhausting yeah. so in yeah. the workplace um how how are people going to be supported like when they say that that's a lot of education for a lot of people in the workplace for bosses you know for people in charge um for fellow workers are they going to go in and do mass education around um, perimenopause? It'll be interesting. I guess that's a strategy mm. that's always been there. It's a little bit like psych safety, which has been yes. given a law now, which mm-hmm. is now acting as yep. you have to do something yes. and it looks like this. Mm-hmm. So it might be, you know, mm. a five-year transition into that, which is basically what the UK have done. They've got right. They've made a law around perimenopause, menopause, and we've made that law around there. So a lot of the exciting ideas are coming out of the UK. Deloitte have created a, a little logo uh, and that might be part of their campaign to say, you know, this is a perimenopause safe environment. Yep. So yep. therefore it opens up. This is a safe conversation to have. Your job won't be um, compromised. You won't be judged uh, yeah. And let's look for a solution to mm-hmm. to get you to your best part. Mm-hmm. And the wonderful um, Victorian uh, women's oh gosh, I'm going to say it wrong. Doesn't matter. Uh, Just say it. Yeah, Victorian <laughs> Women's Association. I'll send you the correct because it's not mm-hmm. that. I'm sure yeah, that'd be but fabulous. And we working. can put it on our notes. Yeah. yeah. Go on. They've been working in the background as a non for profit, looking at pilot policies and profits processes for. Um, how workplaces can bring these ideas into play, even around menstrual pain, for example. Yes. You know, people that are, uh, I have adenomyosis, so Mm. I have excruciating pain, which Mm. has a big impact on my ability to be present and at 100%. But outside of that, I can work at, you know, 130%. So it's this idea of how do we support those few days and, you know, getting having policies around that uh, that, yeah, really see women as Mm -hmm. the leaders that they want to be and working adaptively around Mm -hmm. that. So they've been championing that for a long while. Uh, So, yeah, I think it is a big Mm -hmm. transition for me. I yeah. come in and work with uh, workplaces. I do to the public as well because I feel I feel that that's important too and some people don't feel like they want to do this process for whatever mm. version through their workplace. So yeah. uh, offering that to individuals in the community is my version of it. So yes. where's, where's the self-awareness? And when we have changes in our mental health, it is very much – the recalibration of the brain during this period. It's, okay, how do we lock down? How am I operating around my values now yep. with what's going on in my body, what's going on in my mindset, and how do we click in and really make this a change with change with mm. our eye on a purpose and an eye on what matters, but I'm just operating around, operating around it differently and then what I can offer lifestyle as solutions uh, is very much around what that looks like. Uh, and it's exciting. Uh, it's mm. both of the versions come up with such interesting mm. and valuable stories about success for women in this yes. space. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and changing with change rather than mm. resisting it and just barreling yes, through the way mm. that we always have. Yeah, mm. which tends to create real tricky outcomes. Yeah, it it does. And and the thing is that this has been a much avoided subject for so long. When I started teach my teaching career, there was an older lady and um, I was 22 or 23 at the time and she kept having days off and I said, oh, why, why is that? Oh, it's women's problems, dear. Don't worry about it. You know, so I never really knew about it until until 40 um, because I had no older women in my life either that, that ever presented like that. And for males, this is, a, you know, a huge thing for them to acknowledge and understand. My daughter kind of rolls her eyes every now and then and goes, why was I born a female? You know, it's, it's all of these things that you, the hormonal things that have happened, you know, with your, with your childbirth and, you know, PMT, the whole thing. And it is really important that we all understand how it works and can study it almost so that, like you say, you know when 
that time of the month is going to cause something so that you're aware of it and you understand it and you can warn people in your family if you need to or go into the workplace. Yeah. Understanding these things. That's it. I think there is there is a big movement in all mm. of that and I think you've brought up a really important point that we talk about in the, in the course that maybe the eloquence of it doesn't land in my skill set but go out and get help and maybe mm. from your podcast as well is mm. that there's hormones in the home. So often when women are going through puberty two, they've got a child that's going through puberty one and the clashing of that mm. experience can be, you know, how do we want to go about this so that we can see each other compassionately as well as now that uh, women are having children later in life, mm. are you going through perimenopause and you've got a toddler or like myself, a preppy in the house and that's big amounts yeah. of change there as well. So, you know, what are the eloquence mm. of the family conversation in here and, you know, how does that relate to how I make decisions, the spaces I need to create for myself yeah. to turn up as a mother and a partner that I feel proud and connected to? Yeah, it's really interesting. Mm. And then I must, I must mention amazing change makers and leaders uh, like Holly Bailey, who has uh, a company called Play Like a Girl. And right. that is, uh, and as well, so Jem Jemima Montage, she's recently an uh, Olympic uh, bronze oh, medalist yes. uh, yep. who has a company called uh, Play On. And this is mm -hmm. looking at keeping young girls in sports because they hit right. puberty and then they mm. exit sports. And this is where we see most of our leaders, most of our female leaders, high, high percentage, have been sports people in their right. um, youth. So it looks like there's a character strength that we get from it. So Jemima's bringing up our younger ones to have strong body literacy to celebrate their mm. menstrual yeah. cycle, Yes, celebrate yeah. the advantages mm. and reading and understanding myself in this mm. two-weekly, for most people, cycle that, literally changes our body and mind and how do I lean into that and make mm -hmm. it an advantage and a celebration and a strength of mine? And then the wonderful Holly who is bringing women and uh, young adults into this conversation and saying, how do we take advantage of our female strengths and play like a girl in a way that really puts us where we yeah. want to be from a celebration front rather mm -hmm. than bullying through and coming up with uh, the co our culture's version of how we should be operating uh, from, you know, from a really yucky history of mm. you get to 40 and you mm. disappear or yes. if you're a female in the room, you're dangerous, you're going to get mm. in the way and you're angry and your emotions are all over the shop mm. uh, or, you know, way, way back when we were put in uh, mental, mental institutions yes. and locked away. And even mm. further back, we were called witches and, you know, hung at the stake. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. we're up against this yes. really interesting we culture, are. but we've mm. got these amazing change, change leaders that are just championing in beautiful, yeah. beautiful things. Yeah. 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 Well, it's so good to hear about the changes. And, yes, I do mention, you know, I remember the hysteria and they were put into institutions, you know, when during, I don't know, even the 40s and 50s. So so it is a really important change and there's so much to talk about about it. But unfortunately we've run out of time. Thank you so much for such a wonderful conversation. And I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of what you've just said because it is really important for us to actually embrace it. It is It happens to every woman. So we do need to learn and understand what is happening to our bodies and how to handle what's happening to our bodies yeah thanks kate thanks for letting me come and chat with everyone because oh. it's a bit of a passion piece it's wonderful and i'm so glad it's your passion and we'll have your details in our show notes if anyone needs to get in contact with you where can we reach you uh, do you have a website as well yeah so unamovement.com uh, yeah. and that has uh, ways to have conversations and newsletter links and things like that uh, both for clinical and uh, corporate work, uh, and then Instagram and LinkedIn and yeah. things like that. Yeah, with just my name, uh, yep. all my business handle, Anna Movement. Yeah, beautiful. And and people will be able to find your details in the show notes. Thanks again, Anna. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> You 
You know, it's really time we started having those open and honest conversations about this life-changing stage of life, perimenopause, with all of the women in our lives. It's such an important topic because it affects so many of us, but often we feel like we're tiptoeing around it. So let's break that silence. Talking about our well-being, our bodies and the changes we're experiencing can be incredibly empowering. Whether it's sharing stories over coffee or having a heart-to-heart with a friend, these discussions can foster understanding and support. Because it's not just about the physical changes, it's also about how we feel emotionally and mentally during this transition. So let's create a space where we can share our experiences, exchange tips and offer encouragement. After all, we're all in this together and by opening up, we can all help each other navigate this journey with confidence and grace. Thank you for listening to Parenting and Personalities. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you could leave a rating and a review that would help others learn about this podcast. If you're interested in discovering more about you and your family's personality types, you'll find my book, Who Is This Monster or Treasure in My House, on Booktopia or Amazon. If you have an episode idea, please send a note to thepersonalitycoach at gmail.com. Many thanks to our producers at Stories and Strategies, and we'll see you next time.